tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Russell Blackford, who's sitting on my right. Russell is a writer, philosopher, and literary critic. He's co-joint lecturer in the School of Humanities and Social Science at the University of Newcastle, a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Evolution and Technology, a regular, regular cop-ed columnist with Free Inquiry and laureate of the International Academy of Humanism. Russell's a prolific writer who's authored and co-authored various books, including 50 Voices of Disbelief, Why We Are Atheists, um, Freedom of Religion and the Secular State, Intelligence Unbound, The Future of Uploaded and Machine Minds, Humanity Enhanced, Genetic Choice and the Challenge for Liberal Democracies, and of course, um, probably the main topic for this evening is 50 Great Myths About Atheism. Russell's books will be available for purchase um, any time this evening, and uh, Russell has kindly offered to uh, autograph his books at the end of the evening. It gives me great pleasure again to welcome Russell, who will be talking about science and the right rise of atheism. Please welcome Russell. Thank you, Steve. I'm very, uh, I'm proud, I'm honoured to be here. I thank Steve and whoever else was responsible for the invitation. And uh, let's see how we get on with the night. I have given a version of this talk before. I spoke on this topic at Conway Hall in London uh, in late 2013. It's worth your knowing that because uh, the Conway Hall Ethical Society did subsequently publish a version of this talk in its magazine, The Ethical Record, which has its entire archive online these days. So if by the end of the talk you'd actually like to go away and you know, read a version of this with you know, the references, uh, it's easy to do a bit of Googling and to search on the site for The Ethical Record and find it. But what you'll get will be a longer and doubtless somewhat extemporary version. I never just read notes, so we'll see how we go. Ladies and gentlemen, I propose to talk for about 45 minutes. We'll have a break and we'll see how tight I am for Christian time. The, the topic is science and the rise of atheism, and the idea here is that science has undermined, and rightly, has undermined theism. So what I'll be doing tonight, I will be challenging the view that I call religion, science, accommodationism. That is, religion slash science, accommodationism, which is the view that you know, there's adequate room you know, to accommodate religion within a scientific view of the world. Religion, science, accommodationism, or just plain accommodationism, is the view that I will be challenging tonight. And the positive view that I will be putting forward is that science historically, psychologically, and rationally undermines religion. That's the thesis for tonight. Udo Schuklenk and I have written a, on that thesis at some length in our jointly authored book, 50 Great Myths About Atheism, uh, published in 2013. A lot of what I say tonight will be a kind of pricey of what we say there, but you know, there'll be some original thoughts, no doubt, and as I say, you can see an even shorter version if you want to find it online at the Ethical Record. But the point is, we are going to challenge religion, science, accommodationism, and we're going to argue that science, historically, psychologically, and rationally, does undermine religion. That's a kind of heretical thought. If you go to what's being said by historians, by science advocates, by a lot of other people who are interested in this issue of the relationship between religion and science, you will find the opposite thought. You will find the thought that religion and science are compatible. Sometimes it's put that religion and science are fully compatible. The idea is there's no reason why someone should fear science if they're religious because science does not undermine religion. There's no reason why you should fear sending your students to university to study science you know, if you're a religious person because science you know, does not have to undermine their faith. 
That's a very common view. In the US, it's a very important view where you know, the creationism wars and so on are much more prominent. But it's a very common view that you'll see online, that you'll hear in debate, and which has become kind of the orthodox view. It's become kind of the orthodox view even among science advocates. So that's a view that I will be challenging. Uh, to take a prominent example of that view, I'm just going to put this up on the screen for you to read and I'll come back to it. Here's a statement published by the National Academy of Sciences in the US and the American Association for the Advancement of Science in concert with the Institute of Medicine in the US. So the claim is in science, explanations must be based on evidence drawn from examining the natural world. So far so good, right? Scientifically based observations or experiments that conflict with an explanation uh, eventually must lead to modification or abandonment of the explanation. Religious faith, in contrast, does not depend only on empirical evidence, is not necessarily modified in the face of conflicting evidence, and typically involves supernatural forces or entities. Because they are not part of nature, supernatural entities cannot be investigated by science. Now, this is supposed to be a view as to why religion and science are compatible. I mean, I'd say there's a lot there to make you think why they might be incompatible, and I'm going to come back to this statement before the talk is out. For the moment, I put it forward simply as an exhibit to show that this argument is put, these sorts of statements are made, partly for political purposes, partly, I suppose, because people, in some cases, genuinely philosophically believe them, but they are put all the time and they have become the orthodoxy. This is the orthodoxy that I'll challenge, but I want to make clear that it is an orthodoxy. It is something worth challenging. I'm not attacking you know, a straw man, a straw person in this talk tonight. These are from major science bodies in the United States. I say religion and science really are at odds. The orthodoxy that we're talking about has been fed in a large part by the late Stephen Jay Gould, um, very famous evolutionary biologist, etc., uh, who wrote you know, a great deal that popularised um, biology and evolution, but who put forward his own version of religion, science, accommodationism, probably the most famous accommodationist of recent years. He has this theory or this principle which he calls the principle of non-overlapping magisteria. And I guess a number of you will be aware of that idea. The idea is that religion and science possess separate and non-overlapping so-called magisteria or domains of authority uh, in teaching. Non-overlapping domains of teaching authority and so they can never come into conflict unless one oversteps the other. Now that view, that, that more specific view of Gould's is so well known and so fashionable that it deserves some attention in, in its own right, if only to get it out of the way. So let me say a little bit about this. Um, if we accept Stephen Jay Gould's principle, um, non-overlapping magisterial or NOMA, as I will call it, it means that science has the authority to document natural phenomena, of course, and to theorise about explanatory mechanisms for natural phenomena, fine. By contrast, so Gould tells us, religion has authority. Religion has authority in respect of, I quote, ultimate meaning and moral value. Or, I quote, moral issues about the value and meaning of life. Because those two things supposedly do not overlap, science and religion cannot contradict each other, and so they should exist in mutual respect. According to Gould, we're actually entitled to tell religious leaders to keep out of science, which I suppose is good. We can tell religious leaders to keep out of such matters as the age of the earth, how it came into existence, um, whether our species evolved from earlier forms in life, and so on. But we tell them that not because the science is against them. We say that's not even legitimate as something religion can do. It's not legitimate for religion to have views about 
those kinds of, of things, those cosmological, etc. ideas. Now that, I say, is the wrong way to go about it. Religion has always had views on those topics. It has always been religion's role to put forward a, you know, a comprehensive worldview, a wrong worldview. But religion has always put forward comprehensive worldviews. And you know, what Gould is saying here can only be correct by saying that many religious claims are illegitimate in the first place, not because they're wrong, but because that is not the role of religion. It's not because they're unreasonable in the light of science, it's because religion should never have had that role in the first place. Well, I say that's not a, an historical view of what religion was about. Gould is kind of aware of this in a way, and we'll come to that in a moment, but I just want to emphasise that historically actual religions have always uh, confined, have always not confined themselves simply to making moral claims or claims about value or meaning or purpose. Religions have not just been secular ethical philosophies dressed up with supernatural trappings and some narratives and symbols. That's not been what religions have been about. It's hard to define what religion really is, of course. Various people have tried. You know, anthropologists have tried for their purposes. Lawyers and courts have tried for their purposes. Philosophers have tried for their purposes. But what is pretty clear is that historically religions have been somewhat encyclopedic explanatory systems. They have been somewhat encyclopedic worldviews. They've come complete with ritual observances, uh, standards of conduct, sure, but they've been far more than systems of ritual and morality. They make sense of human experience in terms of an otherworldly realm and its workings. They posit a transcendent dimension to human life. They describe transformative supernatural powers like the Abrahamic God. They ensure our attainment of otherworldly benefits. And they do frequently make statements about re the place of humanity in the space-time universe as well as in relation to a transcendent otherworldly invisible reality. Um, this is how religions have actually worked and it would be naive a historical to claim that this somehow lies outside of the role of religion. You know, with the example of the Bible's creation narrative and the biblical genealogies, you know, you can have all sorts of theological reinterpretations, um, but it would be wrong-headed to say it's just not the role of religion to have the sort of subject matter that's there in the third verse, you know, sorry, the, the third chapter, the first, second chapters of Genesis. Yeah, you know, that is all there. And historically, it was accepted as pretty much literally true. Yeah, you know, it's a fairly new idea that that is not literally true. So what does Gould say about all this? Well, he says, at earlier periods of most Western cultures, when science did not exist as an explicit enterprise, and when a more unified sense of the nature of things gathered under gathered under all why questions under the rubric of religion, issues with factual resolutions now placed under the magisterium of science fell under the aegis of an enlarged concept of religion. That's wrong. It's not that there was some enlarged concept of religion. It's that Gould wants to narrow religion. He wants to narrow what religion has always been and the role that it has always played. It has always operated as a series of encyclopedic belief systems, total encyclopedic worldviews, with moral guidance to the believers, but also with a view about humanity's place, you know, in the space-time world as well as in relation to a transcendent world. That has always been the case with religion. It's really perverse to think like this. It's not that at early stages in our civilization, religion had this enlarged role it's that Gould would like to narrow the role of religion. And, and that means that there's ample opportunity for religion to come into conflict with science. You know, religion has this quite broad role, putting forward encyclopedic worldviews, which certainly can and do and have and continue to come into conflict with scientific methodology and the actual findings of science. We should 
forget about this principle of non-overlapping magisteria. It's not the real world. It's not how religion has ever worked. Um, no more over overlapping, non-overlapping magisteria. No more noma. But we get this situation where religious apologists and secular accommodationists as well, including, as we've seen, you know, science advocacy groups, religious apologists and secular accommodationists like to take an approach that will make religion and science somehow compatible, and they will not necessarily have anything as detailed and substantive and controversial as this specific principle uh, of Gould's. What they often want to argue is a very weak thesis. And it's, it's worth noting how weak this thesis is, because you, know, you, can, you can buy a, a, a weak thesis that really says very little, and then you can pretend that what you thought is a much stronger thesis that says a lot. You can't have it both ways. If you buy a weak thesis, you can't then pretend there's a strong thesis that has a lot of substance to it. The weak thesis is something like this. The findings of science do not logically rule out certain religious doctrines. Right? But that's a very weak thesis that we can probably accept. You can accept the findings to do with, say, biological evolution. I can put forward the basics of how evolutionary theory operates to do with you know, how genes replicate. Um, I can put forward you know, a, theory, a theory such as Darwin put forward and as well established science about um, you know, survival and reproduction of selfish replicators or however you want to characterise that. And there is no contradiction between putting forward that theory and then saying, and by the way, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and was resurrected from the dead in around 30 AD. There's no logical contradiction between those two things. Okay? There's no logical contradiction between putting forward you know, the basic points of, say, biological evolution, you know, which we could do in the way that I just sketched, and then saying, and by the way, the world was created by an all-powerful, all-benevolent God. That in itself is not a contradiction. I can buy that weak thesis. If that's all that accommodationists meant, well, we could buy it. But, but when you buy a weak thesis like that, you can't then turn around or have the accommodationist turn around and say, you have now bought a strong thesis that religion and science are entirely compatible. That's a very different thing. What I think needs to be said more often and in some detail is the full sophistication of why people like me and Richard Dawkins and Jerry Coyne you know, take the non-accommodationist approach. You know, we're often caricatured as putting forward something crude, but we're not. What we're saying is, yes, of course you can buy the weak thesis, but, but having said that, there are all sorts of good substantive reasons when you look at the detail why nonetheless, historically, psychologically and rationally, religion does get undermined by science. And we can tell a story as to why that happens, and that's the story that I want to tell you know, in some detail tonight. So, we can buy the weak thesis, evolutionary theory is true, and that's logically consistent with Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified in 30 AD or thereabouts and was supernaturally raised from the dead. Fine so far, we have not yet logically ruled out the resurrection of Jesus, but that does not get you to the point where you can glibly say science and religion are compatible. And even the fact that a lot of reputable science are, scientists are religious does not get you to that point. I can accept that. As I said, how can there be any incompatibility between religion and science? Because here's you know, this famous scientist, whoever it might be, Ken Miller or whoever it is, that gets brought forward as an example. They are religious, so obviously it's possible to be both religious and to be a, a scientist, right? So religion and science must be entirely compatible. Well, sure. Some of these scientists, even well-known scientists, are religious, perhaps because they are compartmentalising their thinking, perhaps for some other reason, perhaps they're not thinking straight about some of this, but none of that will get you to the point of denying what I claim, that religion 
and science are incompatible in the sense that science historically, psychologically and rationally does undermine religion. So, I submit to you that the cumulative effect of science over the past four to five hundred years has been to make religion far less plausible and to make atheism far more plausible. So that's another way of putting tonight's thesis. To a reasonable, rational, open-minded person using reasonable standards of evidence, science has made religion less plausible and atheism more plausible as we've gone on over the past four to five hundred years of modernity and of modern science that goes with it. Why? Well, for one thing, the better established scientific theories are clearly not compatible with just any religious view. You know, most religions really have made quite encyclopedic sets of claims, and among that they have made many claims that are quite straightforwardly not consistent with scientific theory, well-established, corroborated scientific theory. In fact, typically, religions have made claims about human origins and the place of humanity in the cosmos that do not go well with the findings of science. The overall structure of the cosmos that you'll be able to deduce if you read, say, the Bible, does not go well with the overall structure of the cosmos as revealed by science. You cannot hold those two pictures of this overall structure of the cosmos together in your mind and have them be compatible. They just do not go together. So, okay, of course any particular system of religious belief can be modified to make it compatible with the new structure of the cosmos revealed by science, but it was not compatible in the first place, and if it tries to change, that will lead to problems. Even if it systematically tries to change, every time science finds out something new that you know, religion, the religion in question once contradicted, the religion changes its official doctrines, that's going to cause a problem. It causes problems for all sorts of reasons. One is that religious um, worldviews, I said they're encyclopedic, they're also well integrated. And as you try to modify your integrated theology, you're going to get to the point where, well, frankly, you're going to start pissing off some of your own believers. You know, you, you don't tamper with these theological systems easily. You shift one building block around and it starts affecting other things. So, for example, let's take a, fun, yeah, yeah, take a well known um, theological system. This is just kind of standard Christian fundamentalism, you know, evangelical Protestantism at the kind of fit, fundamentalist end, which I emphasise historically is quite orthodox. And it has these various integrated points, the introduction of sin and corruption into the world. At a specific point in historical time, God's covenant with the Jews, which is also supposedly at a you know, specific sort of point in historical time that can be identified, Jesus of Nazareth's death, resurrection and sacrificial atonement for sin, and we look forward to an ultimate world-cleansing victory of God over Satan, and that all kind of falls apart. It, it kind of becomes hard to maintain this integrated theological system if you no longer believe in a literal Garden of Eden, you know, a literal falling into sin and so on. You, you have to start explaining what this could mean in some metaphorical way or, or something you know, if you're to retain your theological system while losing your literal Garden of Eden. So a system like that you can try modifying it to keep it consistent with what's revealed by science, but you do that at your peril. It's an integrated system. Once you move an element of it, you will get people who will not accept you're doing so. And so you've got a theological problem on your hands, and you're going to have you know, schisms within your church. You're going to have breakaway groups. You're going to have harder line groups. You're going to have all sorts of difficulties. And that is exactly what we see, of course. Right? That's exactly what we see as various brands of old earth creationists and young earth creationists and liberal Christians and all sorts of people with subsets of all those views start debating 
how Christianity should actually be interpreted, despite the fact that what I've got up on here on the side is historically orthodox. Sure, people like St Augustine, you know, great theologians of the early church said it's great to be able to interpret the Bible metaphorically in all sorts of other ways, but they said you interpret it like that as well as interpreting it literally. They didn't say you don't interpret it literally. They said you interpret it literally, but you can also interpret these other levels, these meta metaphorical, symbolic, moral and so on levels. But it is quite historically orthodox to interpret this as well and, and essentially at the literal level. So, sure, modern liberal Christians don't have this theology anymore. They've changed it. They've modified it. But they've done that at their peril and there are now, now people who don't accept it. There are now fundamentalists who stick with this, who are going strong, who have huge mega churches, massive attendances, great success, bringing in huge amounts of money. And it's really them that are having the success you know, in maintaining the, you know, the strength of Christianity on a worldwide scale. It's this kind of historically orthodox theology, what we call fundamentalism, what liberal Christians call fundamentalism, you know, that's tending to prevail in the worldwide you know, struggle within Christianity for the hearts and minds of believers you know, in South America, in Africa, and, and so on. So they've got a problem. You can't just modify your theological system as much as you like to keep it consistent with science. You'll have problems with your own believers. And not only that, the more you modify it, the more reasonable people who might be re you know, relatively neutral to start with are going to ask, well, how could this have been divinely inspired in the first place if it had to keep being modified like this? Right? I mean, it stands to reason, why didn't they get it right? So, OK, I accept that you can go on modifying theological systems to maintain a consistency with science. And if that's all someone means by religion and science being compatible, sure, they're compatible in that weak sense. Now, this is a second weak sense, if you like. But because you've swallowed a weak thesis like that, that does not contradict the fact that science, you know, historically, psychologically and rationally, undermines religion. It does. And, and putting forward these weak theses, or theses, about how certain things can be logically consistent, or how certain theological systems could be modified, you know, if you wanted to do that to keep them consistent with science, those weak theses do not really add up to religion being you know, totally compatible, as they say, with science. They do not in any way undermine the kind of um, incompatibility that I'm talking about. So, right, here is what really is orthodox historical Christianity, which now gets called fundamentalism because it preserves those uh, integrated theological fundamentals. You can tamper with it, but if you tamper with it, you're going to cause problems with your own people, and if you're seen by a neutral person who's going on tampering with it to maintain consistency with science, that neutral person is going to ask, why didn't you get it right in the first place? And as these processes go on, and we see this problem arising within the church, and we see this process going on which casts out on, you know, why didn't they get it right in the first place? As that historical process goes on, as it has, science is actually undermining religion. Historically, it plays out that yeah, religion does get undermined and you see less religious people around. I mean, you just do see less religious people around you know, in advanced countries with science and industrialisation and so on. So historically it does undermine religion. Psychologically it does because, yeah, you look at this, so how can this be? How can this add up? You know, why do they have to keep tampering with it? You know, how can they have been inspired in the first place? Psychologically, it undermines religion, and rationally it undermines religion, because those are perfectly reasonable questions to ask. And a perfectly good answer to those questions is, well, look, it, it looks like they never got it right in the first place. It looks like they were not getting divine revelations, or depending on your religion of choice, you know, they were not getting an angel you know, talking to a holy figure. They were not getting some epistemically, as we philosophers say, superior source. You know, they were not dealing with a source that was better placed to know things, in other words, than where human beings were. That is looking increasingly less plausible 
And as that goes on, historically, religion gets undermined, so we have all these atheists here tonight. Psychologically, of course, you say, what the hell? And, you know, for individual people, religion certainly gets undermined. And it's a rational process. Rationally, it casts out on religion. So that's getting really to the, the heart of the matter. Let me say just a little bit more about how this played out. If we think ourselves back to, say, 1500, I said, you know, think back 400 years or 500 years. 1500, let's say, uh, Luther nailed his 95 theses to a door in 1517, so we're way back even a bit before the Protestant Reformation. Um, Galileo started looking at the, you know, the moon and uh, you know, the moons of Jupiter and all the rest of it in the northern, what was it, the northern winter of 1609, 1610, around about that time. So we're back 100 years or so before the scientific revolution gets going in full strength, a little bit before the, the Protestant revolution gets going. And in about this time, around about, say, 1500, late medieval times, if you like, or very early modernity, if you want to think of it that way, it's pretty much unthinkable in Europe to be an atheist. There are very few atheists in Europe in 1500. And why might that be? Well, they had an integrated worldview once again. Integrated encyclopedic worldviews with no fully developed alternative. Science, as we know, it did not exist. Uh, modern political thought, as we know it, did not exist. There was no integrated encyclopedic alternative available. Not even the kind of incomplete alternative that we now have. Because in our modern view of things, we accept incompleteness and ambiguity. Back in 1500, you didn't do that. You, know, you had a complete worldview, a comprehensive encyclopedic worldview. OK, no real alternative to that in 1500, prior to the rise of modern political thought, modern ethical philosophy and modern science. And within this integrated system, the whole of the natural world is seen by everybody as testifying to divine purpose and action, because after all, there's nothing else uh, that you can use to understand it. So, so everyone kind of goes along with that. Life and society are full of religious uh, ritual and worship, of course, you know, pervaded completely by that. You know, the Catholic Church historically attempted with great success to pervade every stratum and every activity in society in European Christendom. And there's this strong sense that builds up because everybody has it, and you know, there's this kind of you know, fatic thing going on that everyone's feeling kind of the same way about it, of living in an enchanted cosmos, you know, full of agents and powers. Now, look, the fact is there are probably some sceptics around. But you know, let's, let's, let's be realistic. There probably were some sceptics around, and if you did dig back into some of the literature of the time, you'll find that. But still, by and large, this is the way the world looks in 1500. Think how much that's been undermined since. You know, the world today is very different and largely because of what science has done. Also for other reasons, there's been a desacralising of politics as well as a desacralising or disenchantment of the natural world. It would, it would be interesting to talk about how you know, modern political thought has undermined religion as well, and how religion perhaps in itself contributed to that. You know, I said that 1500 is 17 years before Martin Luther nails his theses to the door. You know, the Protestant Revolution had an enormous impact. The, you know, the wars of religion in the 16th and 17th century, you know, the French wars of religion, uh, the Thirty Years' War in Europe early in the 17th century, the, you know, the religious wars, or partly religious wars, have you a look at it, uh, in, in England, and you know, the, 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 the problems of Cromwell and the Irish and all of that, all this strife in which religion was deeply involved, that also must have helped greatly toward the desacralising of you know, the political realm. But we have a desacralising of the realm of nature, of our overall uh, view of the world. And science changes our thinking. Science comes along, I say, you can really see the rise of modern science in a very powerful way. Around about 1609, 1610, when you know, Galileo 
is starting to to develop a scientific methodology that's very recognisable even today. He's starting to use scientific instruments. He's finding out stuff about how the cosmos literally looks when he looks through his telescope. And at that stage, the view that had to build up within the church at the time of what the universe physically is like starts to break down. How can you have um, you know, four, as it originally was, moon circling Jupiter? You know, when you have had this system of the, you know, the various spheres, right? You know, it doesn't make sense that, that Jupiter could itself have moons circling around it. Things like that that Galileo is starting to discover in the early part of the 17th century and other kinds of discoveries around that time start to break things down for that comprehensive encyclopedic view that, that Christianity has become by that point. It's modified itself, of course, over 1,500 years, but it's done so through internal mechanisms, not through something like the challenge of science. Science denies some of the religious claims outright, even back in the early stages of the 17th century, it's denying some of the worldview outright. But when you start to get to modern geology and then to modern evolutionary biology, traditional orthodox religious views are starting to get denied outright. Views that are in holy books, or in some cases views that are in you know, the views of religious thinkers and organisations, the official views of the Catholic Church, or the views of the Church Fathers, you know, the views of great theologians and so on. Those are starting to get challenged in their specifics. Perhaps even more importantly, I mean, that, that first point is the point that often gets made, of course. How can you know, religion survive when we have evolutionary biology? But it's not even so much that specific religious doctrines are incompatible with specific scientific findings. Perhaps more importantly is we're developing a whole new view of the world. We are developing that alternative way of looking at the world that did not exist in 1500, where in European Christendom, there really just was no comprehensive alternative. And you know, we're starting to develop alternative explanations of all sorts of events that you know, were once assigned to the will of God. And you know, we're developing naturalistic philosophies now. And we're developing not just naturalistic scientific philosophies, as I said, we're developing you know, more naturalistic ethical and political philosophies as well. Science is contributing to this whole process where an alternative is in place. And it's thus historically contributing to the breakdown of that situation where there was a kind of monopoly that religion and theology held. And as it does that, it's disenchanting the cosmos more and more. You know, less and less are we explaining the phenomena that we observe, whether it's the starry heavens, or whether it's earthquakes, or whether it's reproduction, whatever it is, less and less are we explaining all of that in terms of miraculous powers or agents. So science, among other things, science and philosophy, are starting to break down this monopoly that the religious worldview you know, has held uh, for so long. So let me stress, as a process like that historically unfolds, science is discrediting and subverting religion. It's revealing religion as a premature view of the world. A view of the world, and of course not one view, there are many religious alternatives, but I'm thinking in particular of the view that prevailed in European Christendom in, say, 1500, right? It's revealing a view of the world like that as premature, as having been put in place before we really had the evidence. And people can see this, OK? It's a, and in some ways, it's a beautiful world. In some ways, it's pretty ugly. I mean, yeah, we know about the Inquisition, we know about the burning of witches, etc., etc. We know about a lot of ugly sides of religion. But there's also a kind of elegance about all this. You know, if you actually study the theology, a lot of very smart people over a long time worked on these theological systems. They are integrated. They do have a kind of beauty, but they're revealed as being premature and speculative and not being put together with the actual evidence that starts to become available. And that is certainly undermining them. So, so they break down. They're poorly evidenced by the emerging standards and they're less and less 
the default position. And as the scientific revolution unfolds to the 17th century and beyond and makes huge strides, of course, again in the, uh, in the 18th century and then the 19th century uh, with, with Darwin you know, in the 1850s, you know, Darwin publishes on the origin of species, but even before that, geology is causing problems for religion. As all that progresses through, that whole you know, integrated, encyclopedic, and in some ways beautiful way of looking at the world is revealed. It's premature, it's breaking down, there's an alternative for it, and the whole religious way of looking at the world is seen as less and less necessary. You don't think it's necessary, do you? But a lot of people in our society no longer see it as necessary because there is a powerful alternative that's on offer. So, you might say, well, all right, um, even Galileo thought that religion is about how to go to heaven while science is about how the heavens go, and the two are compatible. But it's not that simple. Prior to the scientific revolution, if we went back to 1500, or even if we went back to 1609 or 1610 at the start of the scientific revolution, you might hope and think and even expect that as science develops, here we are in 1610, say, you might hope that as science develops, it will converge with religion. Now, what religion is finding through its own internal processes and what science is finding will actually be complementary. They will fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. That's what you should have expected if you are a religious person. Why would they not end up telling the same story if science was developing methodologies to study the natural world? That is exactly what we have not observed. What we have actually observed is science going its own way and developing a view of the world in some ways far stranger than religion ever could have developed. Yeah, religion never thought of quantum mechanics. You know, religion never thought of black holes or you know, the theoretical possibility of time travel in certain ways or time dilation or you know, relativistic effects as you, know, as you approach the speed of light, you know, mass approaches infinity and you know, the Fitzgerald contraction. Religion never thought of any of that. As you actually start to study the world, study the world on scales far vaster than we could ever study it before, study the world on scales far smaller than we could ever study it before, and study deep time, again, on scales far vaster or far deeper than we could ever study it before. As we start to study that, you know, the larger world that unfolds is nothing like what religion ever described. You know, the, the real world in deep time, in the vastness of space, and at that extraordinary <laughs> You know, micro level is very different from what anyone imagined without the evidence. And science is revealing more and more you know, as these strange outcomes, you know, these pre theoretically strange outcomes arise that, yes, of course, religion prevented, you know, presented encyclopedic integrated systems that were premature, that were before we really knew. And a lot of smart people worked on them. And we should pay respect to those people. You know, Aquinas and all those people, yeah, they weren't idiots. They, they did wonderful work, in some ways beautiful work, but they did it without the evidence. And of course, their view of the world in all its encyclopedic quality and its beauty does start to break down. I'm going to stop very soon, but let's just come back to this statement by the NAS again, in the light of all that. Yeah, the, the NAS, um, National Academy of Sciences and other bodies in the United States want to say, despite everything I've just said, that religion and science are you know, fully compatible. And if you're a religious person, don't worry about sending your children off to study science because science does not undermine religion. It will all be OK. And so, again, this statement uh, as to why that is the case. Well. How much of that should we accept? How much of it do you think we should accept any of it? <laughs> we should agree that science eventually rejects hypotheses that conflict with evidence, that word again, evidence. We should agree with that. Um, we should certainly agree that adherence to religious dogma are more resistant than scientists to modifying their claims in the face of evidence. Sure. Um, but how is that supposed to be an argument 
that religion and science are not at odds. I mean, I would thought that's an argument why they are at odds. As soon as they start looking at the same things, science is going to modify its views in the light of the evidence. Religion will be resistant to doing that because resist religion wants to say we got it right in the first place. There's always going to be that tendency in religion to say we got it right in the first place, even if there's also a tendency to try to you know, maintain some sort of uh, logical consistency with the findings of science. So this is a problem. They're using methodologies, but it's not that they're methodologically compatible because they're using different methodologies. They're methodologically incompatible because they're using methodologies, methodologies which can come to you know, different views. And as for these, this last claim, because they are not a part of nature, supernatural entities cannot be investigated by science. I say that's wrong. What I say is this. Science has learned not to posit supernatural entities when it's putting forward explanations. There's a long record of that not working, of that being a very bad idea, and science now will not posit, will not put forward supernatural explanations. If that's what this last sentence said, I'd agree with it. But that's a different claim from saying that science cannot investigate claims about supernatural entities if someone else posits them. It may be able to, it may not be able to. That's going to depend. If I posit a supernatural entity, but say, but by the way, this supernatural entity is capricious, uh, you know, it evades detection systematically, etc., etc. Well, it sounds like I'm, I'm systematically evading being falsified, right? But it is also true that you won't be able to falsify me. If I put forward an all-powerful, capricious supernatural being, no one's going to be able to make any predictions about how that capricious being will act, and so no one's going to be able to falsify a claim about how it acts. I could agree with that. Science cannot falsify supernatural claims about capricious beings, or capricious supernatural forces, but religions, and it's not just religions, you know, it's believers in all sorts of supernatural or anomalous woo, typically they posit these anomalous or supernatural entities, principles, powers, etc., that to some extent are not just capricious. You know, they act in ways that can be expected. You know, God has some kind of psychology. Um, you know, you, you can look at how homeopathy is supposed to work. And it's supposed to work in some way that in theory could be scientifically tested. You know, there's supposed to be certain regularities here. When people put forward claims about supernatural or anomalous you know, entities, forces, principles and so on, as long as there's something there about how those things interact with the observable world, or something there about what traces you would expect them to have left behind in the observable world, such as the traces that would have been left behind by, say, Noah's flood, science can investigate hypotheses about those things. Science cannot always investigate these sorts of supernatural claims, but as long as the claims are about capricious entities, or entities that use their powers to evade detection for some reason, for you know, some perverse reason, because God cannot be tested, right? God cannot be tested, so you can't go and see whether God's there. As long as the supernaturalists are not putting forward those sort of capricious entities, very often their theories can be tested because they would logically leave traces or create further traces in the real observable world. So I don't accept that claim that because they're part of nature, supernatural claims cannot be investigated by science. If there is an extra level of reality that's not nature, but that affects the natural world in some way, I don't see why science can't test that as long as prediction can be made about how it will interact with what science can observe. And that's not that greatly different from how science observes things from deep time you know, we go and we find these things that look like fossilised bones of animals, right? And we can make predictions about, well, if that's what they are, this is what we should expect. Or, you know, the, the micro world, we can't absorb that. We, we, we can't observe it with our native senses, but we can make predictions about how it should affect things like dials on scientific instruments. And so we can test that. You could also test a supernatural principle or force 
as long as it doesn't behave capriciously, as long as the supernaturalist is prepared to say something about how it interacts with the world, or how it did, how it did at some point of time that can be specified as God supposedly did with Noah's flood. I mean, geology was the great um, stressor on religion, more really than biology, because you know, geology, uh, as it unfolded in the 19th century, just was not consistent with what uh, you would have expected from the Genesis record. You know, there's a body of geology that was worked out by flood scientists at the time, and the predictions they made just did not match the traces that we actually find. So I'm going to leave it there for now and break for 10 minutes or so. The conclusion is just, yes, a body of religious beliefs can be modified over time. You can avoid direct logical inconsistency between some of your religious beliefs and scientific findings, but that is not enough in any meaningful sense to establish compatibility between religion and science. Science has done much to disenchant the world, to undermine the intellectual authority of religious organisations, of priests, of religious traditions, of prophets, of holy books and so on. It's reduced the motivation for religious belief. It's made religious belief increasingly less plausible. It's made atheism increasingly <coughs> more plausible. Science, in some cases, has directly falsified specific religious explanations of the natural order. And as all that takes place, science is historically, psychologically, and quite rationally undermining religion. And that's something that we should be prepared and happy to say. We should not take political decisions otherwise. We should be strong and actually say this science has and does undermine religious authority and religious views of the world. Thank you. We'll take a break.